Hi, good afternoon and welcome to another Katrina Talks with series at the OCC. Um, I hope all of our OCC members are doing well this month. This time I've got a real treat for you. I know we have some amazing speakers come on, but not many times do we actually get to say that we've got a gold medalist Olympia, Paralympian in our midst. And I'm so delighted today to welcome Aaron Phipps, who's just back from Tokyo. So he's going to share all his experiences to do with that and sport and as well as sort of give us a bit of a chat around his business and you know some top tips to keep us motivated because as you know these olympians need to keep super motivated so welcome aaron thank you so much for joining me today hi katrina how you doing <laughs> yeah really good thank you um so i'm going to dive straight in if you're all right because i've got lots of questions for you um I know a little bit about your background story, but just for the rest of the sort of members to give a bit of an understanding of where you come from. Um, do you mind telling everybody how this all first started? Because um, I know you haven't always been an amputee. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this is the great thing about these formats, isn't it? You'd have no idea that I'm sat here with my prosthetic legs on, would you? But um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. So yeah, I contracted meningococcal septicemia or meningitis when I was 15. Um, it was flu-like symptoms. Uh, I vomited a few times and I was rushed into hospital and um, I became very poorly very quickly. Now, the Men's C vaccine has been around for years, but I was poorly in 1999 and the vaccine came out in the year 2000. So it's just one of those things, really. But um, it meant that I spent a year in hospital. Um, I was incredibly poorly. When I was first ill, they gave me a 20% chance of survival. And I don't think I ever appreciated what my parents went through until I had my own children, to be honest. But yeah, that must have been absolutely horrendous for them. Mm. And it's a bit more complicated than this. But basically, you, when you have really severe sepsis, your body goes into shutdown mode and sends your blood to your vital organs. So I didn't get enough blood to the ends of my legs and the tips of my fingers, which was why I had to become an amputee in hospital. Gosh, that must have been a real shock for you. But you're right as well with your parents. God. You know, when you're a parent yourself, you really do kind of um, want to take your child's pain away, don't you, and do anything to help them. So um, tell me um, a little bit more about uh, how on earth did you get from play into playing wheelchair rugby? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I haven't always been really sporty. And um, after I was poorly, to be honest, I just fell into it because I agreed to things I shouldn't agree to. And I wanted to raise some money for charity. And I did a fun run, uh, a 10K race in an everyday wheelchair. 2,000 runners in this race was any person doing it in a wheelchair. And I got overtaken wow. by everybody and came at the back. But I loved it. And that led me into doing um, the London Marathon twice. Uh, the second of which quite fast at one hour, 59 minutes. Um, I, and... I mean, I've never run a marathon, but I do know that there's a couple of um, people in, in the OCC that are, um, you know, good runners and they'll be able to tell me whether that's good bad or indifferent <laughs> well it's not I'll be honest it's it's a good time compared to a runner's pace that's like the top elite but in terms of wheelchair pace I'm still half an hour off so the top racers would do a, a marathon in an hour and a half mm -hmm. you have to do an average speed of 18 mile an hour to do that which I will I don't know if I'd ever got there because I'm quite a chunky guy and anyway that, that's how I kind of ended up playing wheelchair rugby so um I was at the racing track championships and I got chatting to a couple of guys about it. And I'm asking about this banana sport, you know, saying you can smash people out their chair. And they're saying, yeah, yeah, of course you can. And I kind of just got forced into trying it, to be honest. Um, went along and gave it a go. Uh, Realised quite quickly that it was like chess with violence. And that I quite like smashing people out of their wheelchair. So it kind of snowballed from there, really. I had the opportunity to give it a go. And um, yeah, it just blew up. What was it called? It wasn't called wheelchair rugby, was it? No, no, no. So it was called Murder Ball to start with. Murder Ball. I mean, that in, in itself, just the name, seriously. It was, <laughs> the, the really brief history lesson, it was invented in Canada in the 70s. There was some quadriplegics who wanted to play a team sport. The only sport was wheelchair basketball. They couldn't play it because, um, because of their level of disability. They invented this sport where you used a volleyball. You could pass any which way. You could crash into each other. They called it Murder Ball. Struggled to get corporate sponsorship for a sport named Murder Ball. Couldn't enter it into the Paralympics called Murder Ball. And that's why it's called wheelchair rugby. That's why it's nothing like rugby. Because everyone thinks we do scrums and we play on a field, but we don't. It's, um, it's called wheelchair rugby, but it's nothing like rugby. Yeah, it's kind of the most, the easiest way to describe something so that people can understand it. Because I think if you 
you mentioned, well, I don't know, probably get quite a lot of people wanting to go and watch Murder Ball. <laughs> I think so. It sounds a bit, it's a bit like saying I have a Stephen King book, wasn't it? Like The Running Man yeah. or something. So, yeah, but no, no corporate sponsor wanted to pick that one up. So they sounds had to change okay. it. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about London 2012. I'd be really interested to hear your journey from there to sort of Tokyo. Oh, yeah. OK, so London was, um, yeah, London was phenomenal. So I started playing wheelchair rugby. And quite quickly, they said, you know, you've, you've got potential if you work your backside off. So I was uh, I was training 10 times a week around a full time job to compete because by this point I've been ma- I was married. You know, I had a job. I couldn't just stop working. I got paid a little bit of money for my rugby and I had an admin job working for the local council. And quite literally, I used to kind of five minute power naps in the disabled toilet at work. So I go to sleep like this and then go back to work, big line across my forehead. <laughs> um, but the goal was I wanted to go to London and, and how phenomenal would that be? And I mean, London 2012, I'm just going on a mad tangent here, but London 2012 was was absolutely unbelievable. I think it changed perceptions of disability in the, in the UK forever. We probably live in one of the most inclusive countries in the entire world now because of that games. Um, you know, two major things happened at once. We nearly sold out the event, which gave it huge credibility. And Channel 4 putting on those like incredible adverts with hip hop music playing and car crashes and explosions. Like disabled sport had never been seen like this before. No. And even going into Tokyo, sort of however many years later, we're still the envy of the world because of our coverage. Um, but I don't like to talk about London too much because we came fifth. And <laughs> I'm an elite athlete and, you know, I wanted to win a medal. But we got knocked out of our group by uh, Japan and America, which meant that we couldn't get out of our group and progress to the semi-final. So um, we, we came fifth. But it was it was a phenomenal experience. But again, I don't really like to speak about it too much. <laughs> I think I think really though the the key thing that sort of stuck out to me when you when you were speaking about that is about your dedication. You know, you mentioned the word goal, dedication. You know, sort of like taking power nap when you could because that's what your dream was. And even though you know, you didn't succeed in sort of getting a medal the first time around. Just the experience and taking part has obviously then taken you further down your journey to get to, you know, where you are now and made it all that more sweeter, maybe. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. I think I think the misconception people have is that when you've been through something catastrophic like I have with meningitis, that that makes you resilient. I don't think that makes you resilient. I, you know, because I wouldn't be any better place to go through that again tomorrow. Um, if anything, it's all locked up here and I don't like to think about it because it was it was horrendous. Mm. But what it did do was make me take opportunities and make positive choices. So if you want to kick up the bum, nearly dying will do that for you. Mm. And, you know, it made me take every opportunity I could, you know, like with the wheelchair racing, trying wheelchair rugby, um, going off into London. You know, um, I, I'm not very good at switching this off either. So it's sort of a curse as well. But then I learned resilience from the experiences that I had, you know, like throwing up on yourself at half past six in the morning before you go to work, training and things. That's when you learn to be resilient. Or in London, you know, doing your absolute best, giving it absolutely everything, and that's still not being good enough. That's Mm. when you learn resilience. Yeah, and I think, you know, when you the words you just said then was not being good enough. If you can actually honestly say that you gave it your all, then of course it was good enough but it just didn't hit you at the, t- at the right time because somebody else managed to get in there or a team managed to do something different. Um, yeah, yeah. And we can all sit back and reflect, can't we, and get a little bit, you know, well, if I'd have done this differently or I'd done that. But if you use that to power you forward and then move straight, you know, into the next lot of, of games and, you know, and learn from that, then I think that's the best that anyone can hope for, really. Um, yeah, well, it kind of did. So I, um, I took a break after London. So I did it all around the wrong way, Katrina. Married, mortgagely, athlete, and that didn't really ever work. So, <laughs> and I had a really young family, so I decided to step down and take a break after London. And then I went back a little bit further down the line. I've got a little um, note here about Kilimanjaro. Can you sort of, um, sort of elaborate more on that? You've been talking to James, haven't you? So, yeah, um, <laughs> while I was taking a break, that seemed like a good idea. So, I, yeah, I did 2012. Um, I took some time away and while I was taking some time away um, that was a charity challenge that just completely blew up so the idea was uh, the Meningitis Research Foundation who I've raised all the money for over the years approached me and sort of said Killy do you fancy it you know we have lots of university students who do it for us 
I said, yeah, okay, not even really knowing what Kilimanjaro was. Although I've got prosthetic legs, I've got bad scars on my legs, so I never would have been able to walk up the mountain. So we set a goal to become the first person in the world to get to the top of Kili in a wheelchair without any assistance. Um, day one was meant to take three hours, took six hours. Day two was meant to take four or five hours, took 10 hours. At this point, they said they were going to have to carry me. I said, in no uncertain terms, they, they weren't going to do that. We nearly had a punch up on the side of a mountain in Tanzania because it got really heated. Um, I had a set of knee pads with me and I knew that I could move faster out of my chair than I could in my wheelchair. So I had a really technical piece of mountaineering equipment with called duct tape. So I duct taped my knee pads to my legs. I jumped out my wheelchair, refused any help from the guides, and I crawled on my hands and knees for four days to get to the summit. Shut up. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. They just they said they're going to carry me. And I was like, I'm not getting carried. No way. So I just did. I, to be honest, I didn't realize what I'd achieved until I got home. Yeah. Because people and say, how did you. it go? And I go, well, crawled. And they go, what do you mean you crawled? And I say, well, I was going to get carried. So I crawled for four days. They go, what do you mean you crawled? And that's kind of when I realized that, you know, what I'd actually achieved. So I, didn't, I didn't realize at the time. No, that is absolutely astounding. I just, I don't, I don't know. It just mesmerizes me that anybody's got, I would have gone, yeah, you can carry me. I'd actually, I mean, I, you know, I haven't got prosthetic, prosthetic legs and I'd get someone to carry me. <laughs> That is definitely resilience, 100%. So, um, okay, so then move forward into sort of uh, how did you get to Tokyo? And uh, when did you start playing again after your break? Yes, okay, so I, I went back in 2017 and I've got a young family, I've got two girls and me and Vicky, my wife, had some big heart-to-heart uh, -heart conversations. You know, the, the team approached me and, and said, did I fancy it? And, you know, we, we kind of settled and we wanted to take the girls to a Paralympics. How cool would that be? So I was back in the thick of it, training again, um, working with a, a new psychologist and um, working with lots of interesting people um, back at the university where I train um, with sports scientists training me on a hundred and fifty thousand pound treadmill. And then, you know, COVID happened. So it was um, it was a whirlwind because, you know, I was back. Everything was going the right direction, building up. I'm doing the best I can as an athlete. The next thing you know, I was stuck at home like everybody else. Day before lockdown happened, I remember running out of the university with a Concept 2 rowing machine. We threw it in the back of my car. I borrowed a couple of 40 kilo dumbbells, got them home and realized I couldn't do anything with them because I had no one who was strong enough to pass them to me. And I couldn't pick them up myself because they were too heavy. So I couldn't do my chest press. So they've been like glorified paperweights. But yeah, <laughs> COVID was, um, I know everyone's a bit sick of hearing about it, but it was bonkers. Um, mm. I was just doing my best, really. I was training in the local park. My trainer would come meet me. Yeah, one day I was trading in the park. We had our kit off to one side and um, lady walked past walking her dog. Dog cocked its leg up, had a wee on my kit. I thought, this really sums up this situation, doesn't it? Um, Do you not know who I am? <laughs> I might as well have said that, yeah. That, 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 that probably been the line, yeah. Do you, you need to clean that off. No, no, not at all. But um, yeah, going into the games was cool. So um, we got to go, but um, as you know, there was no spectators. So... Mm. That was a real crushing blow, really, because I really wanted to take my girls, but they were going to be supporting me from home. Oh, um, but they're, they're so be, proud of you. These, these parties, like, kind of, um, uh, these parties organised at my house. So just briefly about Tokyo then. So we um, went into the games. First game was against uh, Canada, beat Canada. Next game was against New Zealand, beat New Zealand. Last group game against America. Uh, they smashed us. They, we had a seven goal lead. They clawed it back, but we were still through to the semis and we had this tougher semi-final route because we'd lost to America and we had to play Japan. And I remember ringing up Vicky and saying to her, you know, I, I don't know how this is going to go. You need to manage expectations with the girls because um, I'm going to do my best. But, you know, they're current world champions. We haven't beaten them in eight years. And we went into the game against Japan. And uh, well, I'm going to go like public speaking mode for a second, right? And put you in Do there. it. Right, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to tell you that though, because otherwise it's going to go weird if I start talking like a crazy <laughs> person. But because um, we were having a, co a conversation, yeah. But I was a mark in a player called Ikazaki Dasuke, one of the most dominant players in the entire world. And in wheelchair rugby, you've only got 12 seconds to progress the ball across the halfway line. And we're trying to stop Japan from doing that. 
So I was pressing Ikazaki and they couldn't get past us one time. They called a timeout, they reset and they went off again. They passed the ball to him and he was trying to push past me and I was screaming in his face saying, ball's going to come, they've got nothing, he can't get round me, ball's going to come. Anything to put him under pressure. I mean, this is like elite sport, it's not a tickling competition. And he couldn't get past me, so he stopped again, called a second time out. I looked at him, he looked at me and I saw this panic in his eyes and I thought, oh my gosh, we could actually do this. And it felt like I had fireworks going off at the back of my head, screaming, if you win this, you are guaranteed a silver medal, you're through to the final. But I'm just having to suppress all those feelings and focus on my processes, you know, uh, who's got the ball, next play, who are you marking, concentrate on what you're doing, just trying to stay focused. Mm. But we, we beat Japan. And not only did we beat them, we smashed them by sort of seven points, which was huge. Um, I cried for about 20 minutes after that game. It was, oh. it, it was phenomenal because in some ways that was almost my final because the pressure was off. We'd done it. You know, yeah. no European team has ever medaled in the wheelchair rugby. So this is now fairy tale stuff. And we went into the final against the USA. I'm going to come off a of public speaking mode now. Uh, we we you know, <laughs> went into the final against the USA. And, I was getting ready uh, to clap then. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I just set that up because otherwise it would have been like, well, what the hell is, what is he talking about for now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, I was ringing up Vicky and saying, I don't know how this is going to go. You know, mm. most successful wheelchair rugby team of all time, silver medal at the last two games. So they were gunning for us. Yeah. We went into the game and it was, um, it was one of those where, you know, we got by a point, they got by a point, we got by a point, they got by a point. And it was on a Sunday morning. Um, it was on the 30th of August, which was a Sunday, 10 o'clock in the morning. Over a million people tuned in to Channel 4 to watch wow. that game. And, yeah, well, my family were there watching me. And I'll tell you, it's a good time to show you the medal, in it? You know, to yeah, go all the way. Yeah, definitely. You've got to get that out. Uh, to go all the way and, and win this. It's oh, cool, isn't it? Yeah. It is so cool. To do that for my girls. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, was phenomenal. I mean, like, my mum had to put my dad to bed. Two reasons. One, he was really happy. And two, they all started at 10 o'clock in the morning. So you, you can imagine the day. I was a bit jealous of the parties, to be honest. Yeah. But it was, um, yeah, it was, this, is, this is like fairy tale stuff. We shouldn't have won this. So yeah. to go all the way and get this medal was um, still not what I So when you got home, did you all have a big party? Did they do a rerun of the party that you missed? <laughs> I don't think anything will ever be that crazy ever again. But um. We, we got home, there was big street parties that like everybody was out, I had a police escort back. Um, oh, wow. And it, do you know what's been really nice? It's just been doing normal like dad things with my kids. So just taking them swimming and all the things I couldn't do on the build up to the games. I was worried about catching COVID, you know, that's all gone yeah. out the window. Went to Chessington with them the other day. So it's been really nice just being back doing like kind of your normal nine to five, you know, stuff. Yeah, because really. even throughout COVID, obviously, with the training regime that you had to kind of cobble together because you weren't allowed to do that. Obviously, everything else was shut down as well. So every, your life as a dad got put on hold as well, essentially. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it must be yeah. really nice. That's have you been print, busy actually. since you've been back? Like, have your feet, has your feet managed to touch the ground yet? Because, I mean, you know, it's, I know we're just about to hit November, but it's not that long ago. Have you got sort of like loads and loads of stuff stacked up, ready to do? I think you're an amazing public speaker, by the way. The first time I um, heard of you and I, I went and, and watched something that you did, I was just like, it's really, really inspiring. I don't mean to sound that patronising, but hearing somebody's story of what you've achieved and, you know, what you've been through and everything is, is just like, it's really wow. Wow stuff. We're very lucky at the OCC to get you to come no, with this today. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It's something I've done for a number of years. I fell into it, to be honest, and um, I, I really enjoy it. I take a lot of pride in what I do. So my shameless free plug now is if anyone knows of any engagements, I want to be speaking in front of more audiences. So yeah, get in touch with Katrina or myself through my website. I yeah, really absolutely. appreciate that. But um, but yeah, no, I but I had lunch with um Prince Edward, like not last week, the week before, and things like that. Like um as you do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is this is this things like this doesn't happen, they don't happen to me. I mean, um, yeah, the 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 speaking has gone I've gone up through the roof, and I think the medals amplified that. I kind of never appreciated the media hype that came with winning a medal. And there's all the other amazing things as well. Like we've just won um, Paralympic team of the year. So, um, you know, it, it's just been an absolute whirlwind of all these crazy media opportunities, been live on most TV programmes, been in most national, new, every national newspaper. Yeah, it's been, um, but 
one of the big things though is just that people watched it like people often say oh you play that sport murderable yeah i've seen a bit of that it's brutal whereas now people are coming up going we watched the final oh my gosh when you threw that pass and jim missed it they always remember the pass that i bloody missed but um <laughs> you know he <laughs> and he lost us the game but it doesn't matter we won but um it's <laughs> it team sport matter. yeah no no it doesn't but um uh yeah people people know the intricate details of the game and things and they're really into it and they're asking about you know tactics and things and you know i've been into a few schools and all the kids watched it as well yeah it, it, that's cool Ooh, that is really cool so what's next for you now now you've hit that dream goal you've got to have something more up your sleeve i'm um, yeah in paris so the next paralympics i um i probably would have retired but I want to take my girls to a games again. So I've got, I think I've got another three years in me. Yeah. I said that until I got on the treadmill on Monday and went three years is a bloody long time. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm going to have a go at another one, but you know, I'm 38 now. Uh, I'm not getting any younger. I hope that my shoulders hold out and, you know, I don't get injured because it is a contact sport. So hope for the best and see what happens. Mm. So, I mean, obviously we've spoken very a lot around sort of the sports side of things, but it is a business really in its own right. You obviously have to still earn money and sustain yourself. And, you know, is that through way of sponsorship? How do you sort of manage that sort of business side of, of the sport? Yeah, so it's, it's a big mix really. So, yeah, I've got um, some sponsorship deals coming through now because of uh, the gold medal. Um, you know, I'm an ambassador for a few organisations. Put a few too. more O's on the end of your sponsorship prices. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. But um, no, joking aside, so I've been doing my speaking for a long time. So I um, I went self-employed doing that a number of years ago. And it's like anyone who's self-employed, you know, you kind of create your own opportunities, don't you? So, um, you know, I'm often net networking. Well, it's your bread and butter, isn't it? But I'm often networking and, and doing everything. Sorry, there's an alarm going off outside. I'm in my little office oh. in the garden. I don't think that's anything to do with me, so I'm not going to worry. Um, <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so a bit like all of you, you know, you make your opportunities with that. But the gold medal has obviously made that a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. And, you know, I think just listening to your passion, um, you know, and, and, and have, I, I can feel your energy coming out just from video, which is amazing. So it must be great to see you speaking in real life. Um, but, you know, that kind of like what um, that motivation that you've got that keeps it going, like, you know, can you sort of describe it? Can you sort of like put it in a little box for us that we can use it? How, what top tips can you use? You know, when you wake up yeah. in the morning, you just think, mm, OK, I can distract myself with lots of other stuff. What makes you continue? Right. I'll give you a few. OK, so going back to what I said about resilience, I think um, a lot of my drive comes from me being poorly. You know, that that really gave me a kick up the bum um and, and i can't switch it off but it's a bit of a curse but you know i'm not always like this um i've got a really strong support network of people around me who help me so where i train at the university you know i've got professors of sports science that train me i've got strength and conditioning coaches so on those days i'm not feeling great you know they're saying okay should we be easing back on the session should we push you harder they're patting me on the back and they're shouting in my face so i think it's all about that support network you've got around you um, don't try and do this on your own, you know, because you're going to have, like, you know, particularly if you're self-employed, it's just going to do that all the time. You know, you have those highs when you land the big deal and then everything goes quiet again and the big deal falls through and then you get another one. You know, so it's good to have maybe a mastermind group or people that you can chat th things through with. That's, yeah. yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I haven't paid you to say that, by the way, but that's exactly what the OCC does. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, 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 Brilliant. I, I, yeah, I know. I, that wasn't a pug like that. I was just being honest. But um. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's really important to have that support network around you. That's that's absolutely huge. Surround um, yourself with uh, with with uh, good people. We call yeah, it good, good people as well. But you you know your body's like a machine as well. If you if you eat crap and you know you drink a lot of alcohol, you don't stay hydrated or anything, you're going to feel run down. You're not going to feel as good. So we push it to the other extremes because you know we're the product at the end. But you know just making sure you drink two liters of water a day is going to make you feel better you know um drinking a little bit less alcohol is going to make you feel a bit better thinking about the food you're eating and you know um make sure you're not skipping breakfast or lunch and if you if you're one of those people that does you know taking a snack out with you or something you know um all those kind of things just evaluate kind of what you're putting in your body because it's fuel isn't it at the end of the day um you know if you get that wrong you're gonna you know we, we always talk about it as marginal gains so you know if we eat something wrong then you know our performance might go down by a few percent but if you're doing that for a prolonged period, then you're Constantly, not really yeah. as good, you know? Mm, yeah, excellent. I think there have been some great tips there that you've shared with us. Thank you so much. 
I won't keep you any longer because I know you are busy, um, but it is in a, a real coup for us to be able to get you to come and talk to the little OCC group that we run. Um, and I know that they're going to be uh, just as inspired as I have been speaking to you today. So thank you so much for your time. This was actually um, a call that was um, booked three months ago, wasn't it? Just before you went and you were like, no, I'm far too busy now. I'll have to talk post event. And we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but I'm so delighted for you that you came back with your gold medal and uh, and everything paid off. And good luck for Paris, um, you know, because I think you're, you know, now you're up there and that will motivate you to keep going and stay up there. So, And I hope your girls get to see you um, in a real life uh, setting again. So. Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, thanks. Really enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. Thanks everyone. And thanks for being part of Business Buzz as well, because we know that you've come along to that too, up, up, up the north. <laughs> up to north, yeah, no problem, no up problem. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right, cheers, Aaron. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>